Welcome back to another week at Cheney Baptist Church. I'm Daniel, and I'm joined with the senior pastor, uh, Dr. Keith Peters. So last week, you again followed the the concept of God's viewing us like sheep almost in that kind of analogy where He, Jesus is that great shepherd who takes care of us and things like that. What are you going to talk about this week? Well, we're going to shift our focus to another picture or uh perspective or paradigm that Jesus and the other places in the scripture use often, and that's God sees us as part of his family. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's several different uh, ways in which he's referred to us as his family. Most commonly is probably as children, uh, in which we need to look to him for leadership as he would be the father figure in the family situation. Uh, But what else are you going to talk about in that? Well, this morning we're going to focus specifically on how you become part of any family and what are the privileges that are associated with being part of a family and certainly particularly God's family. You, becoming part of a family, legally at least, there's only two ways to do it. Either you're born into that family and that speaks of your, your nature mm-hmm. or you're adopted into the family. Uh, and that speaks of, uh, among other things, your value and that someone chose you. And I think it's interesting God's Word uses both pictures to help us to understand that when we become a part of His family, what well, one, we're not naturally a part of His family, uh, our nature's wrong. Jesus said, you are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. So to become part of God's family, we have to, as Jesus said, Peter and many other places in the Scripture, we must be born again or Titus 3 describes it as being regenerated, reborn, recreated. Uh, And so that makes us part of God's family by virtue of our birth. Uh, But also the Bible uses language in in, uh, Romans 8 and other places that we've been adopted Mm -hmm. into his family. And I think it's interesting that however we get to God's family or any other family, there's an identification and I think this is important in the context of church because so many people have a skewed definition or concept of what the word church means or what the church in God's eyes means. Uh, many people think of a church as a building. Others think of it as a group of people that are gathering together. While church is often associated with a building and certainly a church with no people is not a, by definition a church, there's a, there's a world of difference between a congregation and a community, for instance. And there's a world of difference between a bunch of uh, individual people who happen to be seated in an auditorium or in a classroom or in a living room, for that matter, and people who are, in God's eyes, part of a family. Yeah, absolutely. And you've already talked about a little bit this concept of God adopting us. And if I remember correctly, in Maybe it's in Jewish law. If you're adopted, you can't be disowned, right? Is that correct? I know it's part of the Roman culture of Jesus' day. I'm not sure whether the Jews had the same concept, but I know the Roman adoption was irreversible. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that I I knew I'd heard it somewhere, but I couldn't remember exactly where. Uh, So, yeah, just this idea that in some cases, in some cultures, there is such thing as disowning. But ultimately, we know that it's not legitimate, right? Uh, I'll never not be your son, right? You can say, I don't like you, <laughs> get, uh, get away from me. Uh, but that doesn't change the fact that you, you didn't give birth, but your, your wife, my mom, gave birth to me, uh, and I am your son. So that doesn't change. And the same thing goes with kind of the sense of eternal security. Once we're part of God's family, whether you consider it as like rebirth, like you were talking about, or adoption, which is same concept, different terminology. But just either way, it's just this idea that we're His now, and are we going to please our Father or are we going to displease Him? Because He'll be our Father no matter what. Uh, but what is your relationship going to be like? And w- depending on what you do may damage your relationship, but it's not going to terminate it. Um, go ahead. Y- your mom was reading something to me. I suppose it was a Facebook post last night. Someone had posted about you know, uh, marriage. And uh, someone had often, people often say, well, you don't have to go to church or be a part of a church in order to be a Christian. And while that's technically true, uh, you don't have to come home in order to be married. You can be married to someone and legally and technically, but never spend time with them. Mm -hmm. You may still be legally married, but what is the quality of that relationship going to be? Mm -hmm. And so many people just, they, they 
have a, a worldly perspective of church as a place or even a people that I may occasionally associate with. But a biblical perspective of a church family is much more than a people or place. It's a partnership. It's a relationship or a series of relationships that like family sometimes are strained, uh, but like family, the church is an environment where God expects us to mature and to grow up. Yeah, and of course, God's relationship to us is more than just an analogy between a child and a father. It's also between a married couple. He uses that analogy. And a lot of people, they look at the Old Testament, for example, and they say, why did God have things certain ways? Yesterday, my wife and I, we were uh, in Leviticus. I can't remember the actual chapter. I think it was 19 or something like that. Uh, but we were talking about leprosy. And the children of Israel didn't understand much about germs. They may understand that, you know, stay away from a leprous person. But they, didn't, they weren't medical doctors. But God knew, and He gave them certain procedures. If you see a white spot and then the hair turns white, they're unclean. If you see a white spot, separate them for seven days, then come back if it's gone or it's getting less. Uh, they're clean, you can, stuff like that. Uh, and we look at that and we say, God has a reason for everything that He's doing, even if at the time they didn't understand. Uh, but, so when God says, don't commit adultery, well, what's the reason for that? Why does God want us to keep our covenants in the family marriage sense? Uh, well, the same reason because He wants us to keep our covenant with Him. Uh, when He makes a covenant with us, He keeps it. Not the same way He wants us to keep that covenant. And often with Israel, the covenant He made with them, He referred to it almost like a marriage covenant and said, you've cheated on me. You've committed adultery with me uh, and stuff like that. So oftentimes the family... God formed the family in a way in which it represents our relationship to Him. Uh, and in modern sense, we seem to be breaking down the family concept where uh, we no longer have nuclear families. Or I understand that there were difficult things in the past and currently as well, where the nuclear family wasn't always possible. Maybe the dad left the family. Maybe one of the family members died, like the mom died, and the father had to raise his children alone. I understand these things can happen, sometimes divorces and they remarry, uh, but it's just, it's weird to see the family being attacked, like the nuclear family, for example, where there's mom, dad, and the children. Uh, but I wonder if it's Satan's way of trying to destroy that analogy that God had built when he created humanity and he gave the family, and one of the reasons for that was to, one, function properly, and two, to represent his relationship with us as well. Well, I absolutely believe that that's one of Satan's many methods. Paul talked about that in right into the church of Corinth, the church family of Corinth, that there was an issue which required a family intervention. And thankfully it worked. And uh, the, the person in the church family who was uh, grossly immoral and shaming God because part of the poor, part of the responsibility of being a family member is your conduct reflects on the whole family. It affects the whole family. And that's certainly true of our conduct uh, for good or bad. Uh, we, we bear God's name. We have God's nature if we've been born again, which is what the word regenerated means. We have been regened by the Holy Ghost. Uh, but the world looks at us and Paul said in Romans, the, 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 name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of your behavior. Uh, so we can't not be part of the family of God, but we can certainly act in a way that doesn't reflect well on the family, causing people who may recognize that we claim to be Christians to form opinions about God based on our particular conduct. Yeah, and I think in America, though we are becoming more group identity based than we were before. Uh, overall, we are still, as far as I know, the most individualistic country in the world, which basically means uh, that we put the individual over the group, at least we used to, uh, more often than we do now. But in other cultures, that's very foreign to them. They look at the group as more important than the individual. The individual is just someone inside the group, whereas we would say the group is just made up of a bunch of individuals. Uh, and with that in mind, when we read the Bible, such as in the story of Corinthians, the guy who was having an affair with his mother-in-law, Paul's like, this is just a stepmom. Step okay. Uh, he says, this is disgracing the, the church. And we would look at that and say, what's the big deal? It's his sin. It's not affecting anyone else. 
Uh, but Paul, in his culture, he understood this is impacting the church. You are dragging the name of Christ through the mud, through your actions, and the name of your church through the mud. So for in our culture, you, as my father, you didn't decide what college I went to. I decided it. You didn't decide what career I went to. I decided. You didn't decide what who I married. I decided that. All, all my decisions as an adult is based on my own individual choices, and I will reap the benefits or reap the consequences. You won't go to prison if I do something wrong. Uh, you won't become a millionaire if I do something right, right? It's, it's up to me and my individuality, but in many other cultures, they view it as what the individual in the family does impacts the whole family, so the whole family should have a say in what the individual does, where they go to school, where they go to college, where they go to, uh, what jobs they pursue. Uh, so to us, sometimes the Bible seems so strange to us when we read it from our individualistic perspective, thinking, what does it matter if this guy is sleeping with his stepmom? Yeah, stepmom. Uh, it's not affecting the rest of the church, but Paul knew this is affecting the church. This church may be individuals, but it makes up a group, uh, and the group needs to make a decision if they're going to keep this individual in their group uh, as he continues to drag their name through the mud. Well, another picture which we haven't talked about yet, but eventually I will, and that's God describes church as a body. Mm -hmm. And the whole point is we need each other. We're somewhat dependent on each other in order to function in a healthy way. If my liver has cancer, so what? <laughs> so my liver has cancer. Yeah. It doesn't affect my brain. Well, it will. You know, the, the, Paul used the, the, the situation you described in 1 Corinthians 5, says, don't you know a little leaven will leaven the lump. Mm -hmm. If you have a disease or a cancer or a problem, uh, it's going to affect, eventually permeate the rest of the body or in the context of the bread, the yeast will eventually affect the rest of the dough. Uh, so we're gonna be focusing this morning particularly on how to become part of God's family and then the privileges. Uh, probably after the Easter season, we'll, can, we'll pick up this theme again. Uh, about other aspects of the being a part of the family of God. But I really want to emphasize that just as words have multiple meanings, and if I use a word like love, and, and you may attach your experience or your understanding or even your context to that word, and you and I are not communicating accurately because I may be looking at love from a completely different perspective. The same is true of a parable. You can look at a parable in many different facets of it and draw many applications, but I think God gives us many pictures and many words to describe how he sees us. And my hope and my prayer is that by seeing us through God's eyes, it's not just how he sees us, um, but how he intends for us to be. We are, when we're born again, a part of his family, but are we a functioning part of his family? Are we a healthy part of his family? Are we a accepted part of his family? Even the very name church uh, in, in the Greek language, a, a ecclesia, a called out assembly. Well, who does the calling and why are we called out? It's not just ring the bell, ring the church bell, it's time to gather to go to church. That may be a call for church, but God describes the church in so many different ways in order to help us to understand, this is what I made you to be. This is what I've called you to be. Mm -hmm. And by focusing on what God has called us to be, passages such as 2 Corinthians 3 says, we can become transformed. We can become more like God designed us to be. Yeah, and I know you already talked about a little bit that during the sermon you're going to mention about this rebirth concept where, you know, in John chapter 3, uh, Jesus is talking to Nicodemus and he says what uh, Jesus tells him, you have to be reborn to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And of course, Nicodemus struggles with the concept and Jesus expands on that. But what about in the Old Testament? Uh, are you going to mention how in the Old Testament, how did Abraham pop up in paradise, right? Uh, Abraham didn't know Jesus. Abraham couldn't have... Uh, accepted salvation by saying, yeah, I saw Jesus died on the cross for my sins, I accept that. So are you going to talk about that at all? Uh, well, other than right now, I'm not sure. Salvation is always a response of faith to what God has revealed. Even Jesus said, Abraham saw my day and rejoiced to see it. 
And that may have been a reference to what happened in Genesis 19 when Abraham offered Isaac and God substituted Isaac for, for the ram, the, the, the sheep caught in the thicket. We don't know exactly what Jesus was referring to, but what we do know from the New Testament is Abraham was justified by faith. He believed what God had revealed to him and it was imputed to him for righteousness. We look, he looked forward to the sacrifice. He looked forward to, the, to the, uh, God's atonement for sin. We look back at, with the benefit of history and recognizing who Jesus was and that he was that Lamb of God that died in our place. Our faith is on what has been revealed to us historically and ultimately through God's word. His faith was what God had, obedience to what God had revealed to him. Yeah. We're always saved, by grace we're saved through faith. And in the Old Testament, of course, it was belief that God would forgive sin if I did what God asked me to do in the sacrificial system of the Old Testament, for instance. Yeah, and I think, uh, that that's a big question that people have, is if you were to ask the average Christian, uh, how did the people in the Old Testament go to heaven? They probably have no idea. They'd say, well, we're taught that they have to believe in Jesus, but since Jesus wasn't around, then I guess it's just because they were Jewish, right? They were born Jewish. That must be an automatic step into heaven. Uh, and I think there's that misconception there. The Jewish people certainly had an advantage that other people did not, and that's certainly by the grace of God that they had that advantage. Uh, the advantage was not that they were born that way, but rather they were given the law, such as the sacrifices. And year after year, they sacrificed this lamb, having no idea what it was pointing to, but they believed God. They believed in the promises of God, and those sacrifices eventually pointed to Jesus and what he would do. Uh, so even though in Hebrews, when it talks about how the blood of lambs and goats and bulls can't really take away your sins, it was pointing to Jesus who did take away their sins, and because they had faith in God's promises of the sacrifices, uh, many of them, hopefully all of them, but though I'm sure there were many who did not, uh, they were able to go to heaven, not because of the actual sacrifices themselves, but what it pointed to. Yes. And it all comes back down to what has God revealed, mm -hmm. and what am I going to do with what God has revealed? Yeah, exactly. And even from the very beginning, Adam and Eve were told uh, the seed of the woman, which could very well be pointing to Jesus, the seed of the woman will gain victory over the serpent. He'll crush the head of the serpent. Uh, he'll bruise his heel and he'll crush his head, implying that he would gain victory. So Adam and Eve could have passed that knowledge down from generation to generation, especially Seth's descendants. Uh, and of course, it got to Enoch. And Enoch, somehow, God just looked at Enoch and was like, I want to walk with this guy. This guy, there's something about him. Maybe it's just by God's grace, which everything is. Uh, but maybe there was just something special about him where he said, I want to walk with this guy. I would put it a little bit different twist on how I read that passage. It was Enoch wanted to walk with God. It didn't yeah. say God walked with Enoch. It said Enoch walked with God. Yeah. So we don't know enough of the backstory other than to know that Enoch desired to be with God. Yeah. And even the word Christian comes from Christianos, uh, which comes from Christo, which means to anoint, which means to make contact with. Mm -hmm. And the whole point of we being Christians is the degree to which we will be like Christ is going to be related to the amount of contact we have, awareness we have, mm -hmm. intimacy we have with Him.
children can be dismissed for children's church at this time. Join me in the book of Ephesians in the New Testament. Chapter 2, please. You know, you sometimes hear me talk about the uh, reticular activating system, that portion of our brain that's, I guess, known as the filter of the brain. We see, we hear, we smell so many different things, we can't focus on all of them, so our reticular activating system kind of filters out what, what we don't think is important. It also has the ability to help us see or recognize what we're thinking about. And I noticed as we were singing those songs, that last one written well over 150 years ago, that so many of the songs that we sing are filled with different pictures. We talked about the, the, we sang about the lion that roars, we sang about the lamb, which is very consistent with the series I'm doing because there are so many ways in which God seeks to communicate to us, to help us to see, to understand what he sees. Pictures like parables have many different points of view. I don't have the PowerPoint in the back, by the way. A poem, even, even a word or a phrase, can have multiple definitions. Love, for instance, can mean many, many different things. Hate can mean many, many different things. Many of which are, are, are changed or helped define by our own experiences. This is certainly true of the word father. I don't know all of your story. Some of you know my story. My father was an alcoholic and shot my mom. My experience with my earthly father was not a positive one. So even as a young child at vacation Bible school or backyard Bible clubs, when people would talk about God the Father, it, had, it, didn't, have the right, it didn't have a good connotation with me. So our own experiences sometimes can affect the way we read words or even see pictures. This is certainly true of the word church. If I were to pass out cards and have each of you define what the church is or what the word church means to you, we'd probably have, well, maybe not as many answers as there are people, but certainly multiple answers. Most define today when they hear the word church, they think of a building or maybe a group of people that are very loosely associated with each other, kind of like a club, like the Sam's Club. I go to Sam's, I shop at Walmart, I go to this church. The English word church comes from a Greek word, kurioskos, which means belonging to the Lord. And there's some truth in that. The Bible word, I'm gone again. Thank you. The Bible word for church, the word in the New Testament that's translated church is the word ekklesia, coming from two words, ek, which means out, and kaleho, calling. When you put these two words together, it literally means from a biblical perspective, the church is technically a called out group of people who belong to the Lord. The Bible uses many, many, many different pictures, parables, words to try to help us to see the church from God's perspective, see his people. We looked several weeks ago, months ago actually, about first, par first parables Jesus told in Matthew 13 included the parable that God sees us as a treasure that's hidden in a field that doesn't belong to him. So in order to have access to the treasure, God purchases the whole field. The very next verse says the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant man seeking goodly or valuable pearls. And when he finds one of great price, he sells everything he has so that he can buy that one. Those are two ways in which God illustrates how much he values us. Jeremiah 18, many other passages, Isaiah, describe us as, as clay in the hands of a potter. Isaiah 64, Lord, you're our father. <laughs> We're the clay. You're the potter, and we are all the work of your hands. Many passages in the Scripture, Ephesians 5, 2 Corinthians 11, Revelation chapter 19, Revelation chapter 20, tells us that God sees us like his bride. We're engaged to him. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, the apostle Paul says we are espoused. We are engaged to Christ, but we're not married yet. We, we, don't, un, we don't have the accumulation of that relationship, but we are still expected to be faithful to him. We've spent the last number of weeks talking about the fact that the Bible often refers to us as sheep. The Lord is my shepherd, Psalm 100. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. And this morning, we're going to shift our focus to 
the many ways in which God describes us as his family. Pick up reading with me in Ephesians chapter 2. Verse 1 says, You hath he quickened, made alive, who were dead. There's another picture. We were spiritually dead. God resurrected us. In times past, we walked according to the course of this world, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. That was the before picture. Among whom we all had our conversation, our lifestyle, in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath or judgment. We are not by nature the children of God. We are by creation created in his image, but we are by nature the children of Satan. But God, aren't you glad for Bible buts? But God, who is rich in mercy with the great love wherewith he loved us, by grace we're saved. Pick a reading in verse 8. By grace you're saved through faith. It's not of yourself, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Wherefore, remember, verse 11, that you in times past were Gentiles in the flesh. You were called uncircumcision by the Jews, basically. At that time, verse 12, you were without Christ. You were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. You were strangers from the covenant of promise. You have no hope. You were without God in, this, in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were far off are made near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace. Skip down to verse 16, verse 14 and 15. Talk about the work of, on, on the cross. That he might reconcile unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you. Verse 18, through him we both have access by one spirit of the Father. Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Because of what Jesus did for us. We were once dead, now we're alive. We were once strangers, now we're family. We were once foreigners, now we're citizens of his kingdom. So how does someone become part of a family? Give me, give me how can someone legally who wasn't, how does someone become part of your family? How did your kids become part of your family? They were born into it. And that's certainly true. We are either brought into a family by birth or conception. John 3, 3. Except a man be born again or a woman, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. Kingdom of heaven. First Peter chapter 1. Uh, you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold, but you were born again by the word of God, which lives and abide forever. Or another way is by being adopted. And instead of conception, this is an invitation. You aren't naturally my son, but I'm going to adopt you. I'm going to become your father. And that's an option. You can agree to the adoption or not, I suppose. And Bob, the Bible uses both pictures to help us to see different aspects of this way in which we become part of God's family. But I want to focus this morning on the privilege we have of being part of God's family. As members of his family, we inherit his nature. This is where the picture of born again comes in. We inherit his nature. The age-old uh, societal question, is it nature or nurture that causes someone to be what they are? And it's probably some of both. We are by nature the children of the devil, so God gives us a new nature when we're born again. He gives us his nature. We obtain his nature. Second Peter chapter 1, his divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him that called us to glory and virtue. And, uh, on Tuesday nights, we're focusing on this, these passages in Second Peter. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these, the promises of God, the word of God, by these we might be partakers of the divine nature. So when does this actually happen? Well, it happens the moment we recognize what God has done and we respond in faith to it. John three sixteen. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth, pischuo, puts their trust in him, shall not perish, but have everlasting life. A passage that I often like, I, I was telling my kids driving across the country, some of them driving across the country last week, we're talking about our church in North Carolina, and there was a man in, in my church named Tommy. And I would so often refer to this picture that Tommy went out and bought the biggest picture he can find. You've all seen this picture of Jesus in the garden, knocking on a door, 
and there's no handle on that door. And the, the painter who painted that originally 150 years ago used that picture, sometimes it's called Jesus, the light of the world, or Jesus in the garden, to illustrate that there is no, God will not force his way into our life. There's no handle on that door illustrating it has to be opened from the inside. Jesus said, I stand at the door and knock. And Romans 10.10 10 says it's with the heart man believes under righteousness. So that door is symbolic, another symbol God uses to help us to understand, of our heart. If anyone will hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him. So the moment we recognize Jesus loves us enough, he paid the penalty for our sin, and he comes and he invites us to trust him. The moment we respond in faith or trust we open our hearts, we open our life to him, he comes into us, and with him comes that nature. God who commanded the light, 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says, if our gospel is hid, the good news of what Jesus has done, if it's hid, it's hid to those who are lost, in whom the God, little g, of this world, which is who? The God of this world is who? And unless you get that, life won't make sense. God gets blamed, God with a capital G gets blamed for a lot of what God with a little g does. But the devil is the God of this world. How to become the God of this world? When Jesus was tempted by the devil in the wilderness, he gave an answer. He put one of the temptations was taking Jesus on a high mountain, showing him all the glories of the kings of the world in a moment. He said, if you'll worship me, I'll give the, to the, these to you because that has been delivered to me. Who gave Satan his authority? We did. Know you not, Romans chapter 6, that to whom you yield yourself servants to obey his servants you are, whether it's sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. God who, comm but verse uh, 4, the God of this world blinds minds, verse 5. Um, Let's the light of the glorious gospel of Christ as the image of God should shine in them. For we preach not ourselves, but Jesus Christ and ourselves, your servants, for his sake. But God, with a capital G, commanded the light to shine in the darkness has shined in our hearts. Satan blinds our hearts, our minds, convinces us we're not that bad, convinces us God loves us too much to send us to the hell we deserve, convinces us that, that uh, just get religious, try harder. That's how Satan deceives us. But God pierces the darkness of our hearts and gives us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face or person of Jesus Christ. We have this treasure and earthen vessels. So when the moment we recognize God's grace and we respond to it, how? Because the moment we do that, God comes into our lives. Verily I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, that which is born of spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, you must be born again. Not of flesh, but of spirit. Notice the capital S there, that's talking about God's spirit. The word born again, genao, it means regenerated. It comes from the Greek word genos. The New Testament was originally written in Greek. Genos means kin, which even in this verse is saying you're not related to God. So the way you get related to God is by being born again. Not by works of righteousness, Titus says, which we have done. That's what religion tells us. Just work hard at being more religious. God says, no, that's not how it happens. But it happens according to his mercy. We don't save ourselves. He saves us. How does he do it? By the washing of regeneration. The word regeneration means regened. Washing of regeneration, renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Being justified by his grace. The word justified means rendered innocent. How can we who are naturally guilty be rendered innocent? His grace. How could, God, how could a God, just God do that? The wages of sin is death, Romans 6, 23. Romans 5, 8 said, but God demonstrated his love even while we were sinners, Christ died for us. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. How, what was the price of that gift? Jesus to die in our place, taking our sin. That's the reference we sang about a few minutes ago about the lamb. Jesus, John the Baptist looked at Jesus and said, that's the Lamb of God, the sacrificial Lamb who's going to take away the sins of the world. Galatians 4 puts it this way. When the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, virgin born, made under the law, to redeem them that are under the law, under the judgment of the law, 
that we might receive the adoption of sons. Because we're sons, and it's a generic term for mankind, men, women, and children, because we're sons, God sends forth the Spirit of His Son, capital S, into our hearts, crying, Abba, or Daddy. Abba is the Hebrew Greek word for Daddy, Abba, Father. Romans 8 puts it this way, we've not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but we've received the spirit of adoption. It means God chose us, and God invites us. When we respond to that invitation, his spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Why? Why do we need God's spirit? Well, because in one sense we're adopted, we don't have God's nature. We don't look like God. We don't act like God. So God sends his spirit into our hearts at adoption to regenerate us, to regene us. Be not conformed to this world, the Bible says, but be transformed. Metamorphuo is the word in the original language of the Bible. We know what morphosis means. Metamorphuo comes from morphosis. God gives us the, the spiritual genes so that we can no longer be a caterpillar, but we can be a butterfly. That's what metamorphosis is. It take, we don't look like what we're going to be. First John chapter 3 says, uh, Now little children abide in him, that when he may appear, we may have confidence, not be ashamed that his coming. That's verse 28. Verse 3 says, What manner of love, chapter 3, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. Beloved, now are we the children of God, but it does not yet appear what we shall be. The morphosis hadn't been completed yet. But the seed of God's Spirit is in our hearts, and it's working His way, regenerating us and changing us from the inside out. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, But we, when, when we, with an open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed from glory to glory, from one level of maturity to another level of maturity, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Now, sometimes when a child is born, you can see, see so clearly he's got his father's nose, his father's, his mother's ears. How many of you remember every time Bryce had a grandchild, Bryce Madison, who went home to be with the Lord a little over a year ago, every grandchild Bryce had looked like Bryce, that poor thing, black spiky hair, just black as coal. So sometimes when a child is born, you can see pretty clearly the genetics. But thankfully, all of those grandkids grew out of it. <laughs> sometimes you can't initially see. How many of you remember years ago, way back in the late 70s, Amy Grant was a teenager and she, sang, she wrote a song I may not be every mother's dream of her little girl. My face may not grace the minds of everyone in the world, but that's okay as long as I can have one wish I pray. When people look into my life, I want to hear them say, she's got her father's eyes, eyes full of compassion, seeing every tear, pain, knowing what you're going through and feeling it the same. See, sometimes... The moment we are born again, we have God's Spirit, but sometimes it takes time to work its way into a family resemblance. Romans 8, 28, God says, All things work together for good to them that love God, who are called according to his purposes. For whom he did foreknow, he did also predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. God wants us to reflect his image. This isn't physical. This is more spiritual. The fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. That's what God is trying to cultivate in our lives. So one of the privileges we have of being part of the family of God is we, we have his nature. We have access to his nature. Now, we can, we can resist what God is trying to do. Just like a child, my children, though every cell in their body can identify them with me, sometimes their conduct doesn't reflect the values that they were given. And that's true of God's children as well. But not only do we have his nature, we share his riches or his resources. Romans 8, we just talked about his spirit bears witness with our spirit that we're the children of God. 
And if children, then heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, we shall also be glorified together. For I reckon, what's the word reckon mean? Any Southerners here? It doesn't just mean I think. A reckon means a reckoning. I've looked at it carefully. I've reached a conclusion. Paul is saying, I've looked at life carefully, and this is what I have reckoned. That the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the, of the, the creature is made subject to vanity. Not only they, talking about life and creation, not only they, but we also which have the first fruits of the Spirit, we who are God's children. We suffer, we struggle, we groan. Life's not fair, and God is not the only force at work in this life. And we suffer because of our own stupid choices, and we suffer because of the stupid choices of our politicians. We suffer because of the stupid choices of our parents. We suffer because of the stupid choices of our partners. We're in a sin-cursed world, but God is bigger than this world. And it goes on to say, all things work together for good. God can use even the disappointments of life. But he says, but even the disappointments of life are not worthy to be compared to the glory which should be revealed in us. Ephesians 1 writes, it puts it this way. Paul is praying and writing to the church, God's people in the city of Ephesus. I'm praying that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened. That means someone has to turn the lights on. And we're not it. God has to do this. That you might know what is the hope, the privilege of his calling. And what the riches of the glory of his inheritance is in the saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power. Paul put it this way in Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. So we have his nature when we are born again into his family. We share his riches and we bear his name. Galatians 4, we quoted a few moments ago, uh, shared a few moments ago, his spirit bears witness with our spirit. We're the children of God. Because we're sons, he spent, sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. His spirit, uh, therefore, now we're no longer a servant, but we're a son, a child of God. Acts eleven twenty six tells us that the name Christian was not what disciples called themselves. It's what the world called disciples. That's a very important point. The early church didn't choose the name Christians. It was given to them as people watched them. And they used the word Christians to describe them. It comes from the word Christianos, which comes from Christos, Christ, which means anointed. Isaiah 61 was the passage Jesus read from in his first message to his hometown in Nazareth. And the gospel records that he opened and he found the place where it was written, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the meek. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to appoint unto those that mourn, to give them beauty for ashes and the oil of joy for mourning and the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Lots of good news. Verse 3, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. The passage Jesus chose to explain why he came said, you're broken. I want to bring healing. You're in despair. I've come to give you hope. You're dead. I'm coming to give you new life. And I want you to grow. Your, your, your trees of righteousness, I want you to grow so that people can look at you and say, look at what God has done. What did Morse, Samuel Morse, what was the first message he sent via Morse code? Anyone remember that message? What hath God wrought? And that's what God wants to have happen. As we take on his likeness, 
And people look at our lives and say, wow, what is God doing in your life? Anointed. The Lord anointed Jesus. We've been studying in one of the adult classes, book of Ephesians, we're on chapter 4, where it talks about walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. We've all been anointed if we're children of God. We think of anointed as uh, Samuel pouring the oil over David's head, anointing him to be king. The word anointed basically says you have been chosen for a specific purpose. David was chosen to be king. Aaron was chosen to be the priest. We have been chosen to bear his name in his image. First Peter chapter 2, we are a Peter is a general book written to all believers of his day and because the Holy Spirit inspired it, believers of our day. And he says, what are you? Cho you're a chosen. You've been anointed. You've been selected. You're a chosen generation. You're a royal priesthood. You're supposed to help minister, represent God. You're a holy nation. You are a peculiar people. The word peculiar. Peripoiesis. It means you have been purchased. You are precious. And you have been preserved. We're a peculiar people. Why have we been chosen? To show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You'll find major themes wo woven throughout the word of God. Isaiah 61, the passage Jesus said, this is why I'm here, says, why am I going to do this for you? Not just so you can feel better about yourself. I'm going to do this for you so you can grow and I can be glorified. People can recognize what difference God can make in the life of a human being. Why have we been chosen, Peter said, to show the praises of him who's called us out of darkness. If I can use our current analogy, who chose to adopt us. Which in times past, remember what we said in Ephesians chapter 2, we were dead, we were aliens, we were strangers, but now we're close and now we're part of God's family. Peter carries the same thing. In times past, you were not a people. You didn't belong to God. But now you're the people of God. The word Christianos comes from Christos, which means anointed. The word Christos comes from Creo, which means to make contact. When anyone was anointed in the Bible, usually with oil, the oil would be poured or applied to him. There would be contact. The precious truth here is we have Christians, the concept of Christians comes from the point not just that we've been chosen and anointed for purposes but we've made contact with God or God has made contact with us and of course that's the precious promise of the Holy Spirit I will not leave you comfortless I will come and he will abide with you forever now, now in reality the more contact we have with Christ the more consistently we become like him most people think Christian means what like Christ the name came because people in the city of Antioch looked at these believers who they knew weren't always like this, and they said, wow, they're acting like Jesus. And the name Christian stuck. But the word literally mean, comes from a word that contact. You've been with Jesus. You've spent time with Jesus. You've had contact with Jesus. And as a result, you're beginning to bear a family resemblance. You're beginning to reflect him. Jesus put it this way. You are the vine. And by the way, he said this on the way to the Garden of Gethsemane where he was about to be betrayed and start the journey to the cross of Calvary. He said, I am the vine. My father is the husbandman. You're the branches. Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes away. Every branch that bears fruit, he purges it that it may bring forth more fruit. Abide in me. Abide is the Greek word meno. It means stay with me. Walk with me. Work with me. Abide in me. And I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except you abide in me. Acts 4.13, talking about Peter and John in the early days of the church. Peter and John was arrested because they were ministering to people and bringing hope back to people. And the priests were threatened because whenever they would heal or help someone, a crowd would gather and they'd talk about Jesus Christ and, and why he came. And the, the priests and the politicians of Jerusalem were threatened by that. And so they brought Peter and John in and they 
arrested them and they eventually beat them but challenged them and and they said didn't we charge you not to speak in his name peter said whether it's right to to uh, listen to you more than god judge you we cannot help but speak the things which we've seen and heard and they marveled the word is through mazo they wondered they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Here it is, these poor, and the point was, these were not educated people. These were fishermen from Galilee, and yet they had such power. God was doing such miracles through their life, and, and they wondered, they marveled and said, they're like Jesus. They spent time with Jesus. Your behavior, if you're a child of God, your behavior reflects the degree of intimacy in your relationship with Jesus. 1 Peter 3, 18. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Honor him. Be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is within you. What is that saying? It's saying conduct your lives in such a way. Honor God in your heart, and it will work its way out through your life. And people will want to know, why are you so different? That means, since we bear his name, that our conduct reflects on him. And because it reflects on him, it affects others. Now, this is where I stop preaching and I start meddling. <laughs> Not really. I don't need to. We all know this is true. Everything we have done, especially in a little town like Cheney, I've been in every state in the United States. I've lived in a lot of them. Never really lived in a little town. And God chose to plant me right here. I told my wife when we met in Hawaii, honey, if you'll marry me, I'll take you places. <laughs> but we all know, especially those of us that come from Garden Plain or Mount Hope or Cheney, Nothing's private. <laughs> Somebody really screws up in a little town, everybody knows about it. Well, the reality is that's true. The more, more influential or the more known you are, the more people know when you mess up, right? We understand that, especially in little towns, what we do or what our family does causes people to form opinions, right? Right? That's true of God's children as well, regardless of the size of the town in which you live. What we do reflects on our family. And what we do as children of God reflect on him. And because it reflects on him, it affects the people around us. Sometimes that's good. Sometimes my kids, as they grew up, or when we went to the parent teachers, we homeschooled our kids until we moved here, and we chose to put those who wanted into the public school. And Linda and I would go and, and uh, talk to their teachers, and we were just amazed at the children we had born. Man, they were wonderful. <laughs> teachers said, Oh, they're so respectful, and they're so delightful. And I'm thinking, Do we have the right child here? Sometimes my kids would go and do work for some of you or other people. They, oh, your kids are such hard workers. And I'm thinking, what I'm trying to say is sometimes, <laughs> sometimes their conduct makes you proud. That's what I'm saying. Sometimes it makes you proud. Jesus said, let your light so shine before men. Why? That they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. There have been times I've been so proud of my kids that I just could burst. Can you associate with that? Sometimes the effect is not so positive. Sometimes it's negative. Paul wrote to the church of Rome and said, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. What does that mean? means your conduct is causing people to curse God. I, had a little, I show videos just about every Sunday. Remember that video I showed? It was a live stream of a Google search engine. Why are Christians so, and he put an A, angry, arrogant. 
be uh, brutal. C, critical. You, it, now, I, I know we can go into the sp- sp- why Google search engines produces what it does, but the reality is people have formed opinions about God because of the conduct of his children. And sometimes it's not positive. Can I see your hands? How many have ever been negatively affected or felt negative because of the choices or conduct of someone who claimed to be a follower of Jesus Christ? Can I see your hands? My last church, we, we built that, we, we started that church. We called it Grace. And we decided we wanted to be a place where people who have been hurt in church can come and find healing. So as members of God's family, the privileges we have of being a part of God's family, we receive his nature, we share his resources, we bear his reputation. (laughs) With great privilege comes great responsibility. Ever see a Spider-Man movie? (laughs) Some of you know what I'm talking about. The reality is it's not from Hollywood, it's from God's word. With great privilege comes great responsibility. We open by describing a church. An audience is a general group of unrelated people drawn together by a short-lived attraction, event, or interest. There's lots of audiences. We're an audience at a movie. We're an audience at a concert. We're an audience at a rally. You can be an audience and know nobody else around you. You can be an audience, you're part of a group, you're part of an assembly, but you're not connected to anybody else except by a mutual interest in whatever's going on. That's an audience. A church is a specific group of people who belong to the Lord and have been called together by him to accomplish his purposes. Which most accurately of describes us. Eventually, we'll get to the picture the Bible uses in Ephesians 4 and so many other places that we're not just a, the church is a body, which means we're connected and we're interdependent on one another. But the point is, God describes his church in the passage in Ephesians and others as a family. Not physically attached, but attached, attached by genetics, attached by a common father who grows and tries to nurture us. There's an old song, kind of a southern gospel song, I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Look at all these pictures in one song that describes what the Bible talks about. Joint heirs with Jesus, Romans chapter 8, Galatians chapter 4, as we travel this sod, for I'm part of the family, the family of God. You will notice we say brother and sister around here. It's because we're family. These folks are so near. When one has a heartache, we all shed the tears. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. God has put the members in the body together such that when one member suffers, they all suffer with it. You ever stub a toe? When one has a heartache, we all share the tears and rejoice in each victory in this family so dear. That's the way it's supposed to be. From the door of an orphanage to the house of the king, no longer an outcast, a new song I sing, Psalm 40. From rags to riches, from the weak to the strong, I'm not worthy to be here, but praise God, I belong. You see, folks, the church is more than a building. A church may be a physical structure, and people will look at that church. That's not the church. That's just a building. I don't want to offend people. I don't want to upset people. This this building was built 20 years ago, give or take, and it was only part phase one of of a three-phase program. And and this doesn't really look like a church. It looks like a big warehouse. We do what we can to dress it up, but it's a just it's a place, multi-use building is what it is. It doesn't look like a church. And I, occasionally I have people say, Pastor, when are we going to build the church? I say, you got $3 million you want to give me? Because that's about what it's going to cost to build phase three. But another reason why I don't, I'm not overly active to go deeply into debt to build something that looks like a church 
It's because the church isn't the building. I would rather invest in the people so that when they go home and when they go to their office and when they go to the school, they look like the church. They recognize that they're part of the family of God. So church is not something or some place you go to. It's a family you belong to. Hebrews 10, 23. Let us hold fast to the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke and to love, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as a matter of some is, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. I'm not worthy to be here, the songwriter said. Not worthy to be part of God's family. Not worthy to be a child of God. Not worthy to be your brother and sister. I'm your brother. <laughs> but thank God I belong. My question is, who do you belong to? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to be a part of this particular church family. I know the church is bigger than Cheney Baptist, and I know that there are pockets of people all over the world that are meeting together, that you look at them and say, that's my church. I'm grateful, Lord. But almost 12 years ago, 12 years ago this month, I believe, is when I first came to try to determine whether this was the particular church that you wanted me and my family to be a part of. You confirmed that through this church and through our own impressions of your will. Thank you for bringing us this way with this group of people. Lord, there are people right now, people here, sometimes some, in some cases people not here that are looking for a church family. I pray that your Holy Spirit would help them to recognize it. Yes, it's important to identify with a group of people that you can learn to love so that we can fulfill some of the almost 50 commands of one another commands that your word tells us. So as it says in Hebrews, instead of forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, we can provoke one another to love and to good works. I pray that you would guide those who are on that journey trying to understand where it is that you have called them specifically to serve. But Lord, it's possible that here in this room or perhaps listening to, to me on one of the media outlets or someone that's not even a part of your family. Oh, they may be religious. They may have gone through some kind of confirmation or religious practice. But they don't know the joy of your peace and your forgiveness. They don't know the privilege of partnering with you. They don't know the responsibility they have to reflect your qualities in their world, your light in the lives that are shrouded in darkness and despair. I pray that this might be a day where they would recognize the truth that was reflected in that video that we began the service with, the depth of your love, the remarkable breadth of your plan for them and your invitation to open their hearts in faith, to recognize and respond to your grace. Lord, I pray that you would help us as a local church family to learn how to love one another so that individually and corporately we can accurately reflect your love to our world. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.